because today's speaker was actually the, the winner of our three minute thesis competition this year. You know, we, we liked Megan so much, we, we asked if she could come back and, and take us through a full session. So introducing Megan, she's originally from Vernon, British Columbia. She is a social and military historian of the 20th century. She has an honors bachelor of arts degree from Wilfrid Laurier University and a master of arts degree from the University of Waterloo. Her federally funded master's research focused on the Canadian experience of the Second World War, specifically the Vernon military camp. Megan's work has been published by a number of platforms, and in 2022, she won the Tri-University History Program's Top Essay Prize for Master's Students. She's currently located in London, England, where she's beginning a fully funded PhD at King's College London and the Imperial War Museum, supervised by Dr. Jonathan Fennell. Her dissertation will look at Second World War Army training across the Commonwealth. So please join me in welcoming Megan. And Megan, the platform is all yours. Great, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I mean, wherever whatever time of the day it is for you, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Tom and Chris and all the contributors to Heritage Days for running this History Symposium series. Uh, the Canadian military history community is strengthened by the work uh, that these individuals do, and it's really vital that we continue to come together um, to discuss and share our research. So as Chris mentioned, I'm coming to you today from London, England, um, and I know that there are viewers coming from all around the world. So this is really wonderful and just speaks to the work that they have done um, to extend their reach. So the research I'd like to share with you today stems from work that I did last year during my master's degree at the University of Waterloo. Um, I'm aiming to talk for about 45 minutes uh, and then I'll answer any questions, but a benefit of doing this digitally means that you don't have to remember your questions. I know <laughs> I always struggle with that. Um, so anytime questions come to you, just pop them in the chat and then we will answer them um, at the end of the talk. So good morale is the lifeblood of a successful army. As Napoleon Bonaparte said, in war, the morale is to the physical as 10 to one. But as historians, how do we measure this unquantifiable characteristic? Do we judge it based on how well men fight in battle, regardless of how they feel of the cause? Or should their performance in battle be considered secondly to what they think or feel or say? What about criminal behavior and outbursts? Morale is certainly a slippery topic as shown by the fact that historians can't even agree on a definition of it. But regardless of the difficulty, it's too important a topic for military historians to shy away from. So I'm gonna discuss a small sliver of it today. There hasn't been a lot of work done on Canadian army morale in the Second World War, but historians are working towards it. Some of you may be familiar with Robin Engin's book. Uh, you can see one of them on the left there, uh, which discuss morale and combat motivation in the Canadian army. There's also been work by, uh, done by Jeffrey Hayes, William Pratt, and Jeffrey Keshin, and more recently Jonathan Fennell, my current PhD supervisor, published a 700-page transnational history of British and Commonwealth armies in the Second World War, and that is highly focused on morale. However, to discuss Jonathan's work, Canada is only a small part of that large study, and perhaps Jonathan doesn't consider national circumstances fairly enough. How can we expect Canadian morale to be the same as British when the former has been on home hasn't been on home soil for multiple years? When um, sorry, the latter has not. Sorry, the Canadians haven't been on home soil in multiple years, but the Brits have perhaps maybe visited their family the week before shipping off to battle, or perhaps French Canadians who don't have the same attachment to English lang language, culture, or religion uh, in what is chiefly an English army. It's certainly something to consider. This takes me to the topic of male. In my research, I'm using male as a tool to study morale. The topic jumped out at me after reading Farley Mowat's collection of letters between he and his father, which has been published in a collection of, um, a collection of works titled My Father's Son. If you're interested in wartime experiences, I'd highly recommend reading that one. So not only was mail a way of staying in touch with family and friends, but it also provided an intimate space for soldiers to share, rant, or express. Letters provided comfort and represented life beyond war. The Canadian chain of command recognized the value of mail and gave it due attention, being sure to publicize their efforts to both soldiers and civilians. 
Not only were the logistics of mail delivery important, but the contents of soldiers' letters provided valuable insight into their private thoughts. These opinions were surveyed by army censors and summarized into reports, which brought mail's content out of the private sphere and into the army bureaucracy. So all that I just talked about, that I will go into further throughout the talk, but my research argues for the multifaceted role that mail played for Canadians during the Italian campaign. By viewing mail through these six themes, its value is emphasized. Mail and morale are closely linked, a relationship that is exemplified by using the Itali Italian campaign as a case study. So briefly, I want to justify why I'm limiting this presentation to only the Italian campaign. So firstly, it stems from the chronology of the war. So from 1940 until about halfway through 1943, most of the Canadian army saw no real action. Um, so the many thousands that were stationed in the United Kingdom were mostly on training exercises and in their time off, they were drinking and, um, you know, fraternizing with British women. But really, they were getting antsy to get into action, if only to cure their own boredom. The Italian campaign was the Canadian Army's first sustained action of the war, causing it to act as a testing ground for postal coordination. Organizing mail for active fighting formations was a world away from doing that for sedentary units in the UK, leading to necessary growing pains. It's in Italy that the Postal Corps was able to work through these issues. Additionally, the conditions faced by Canadian troops in Italy make for a fascinating study. The Italian campaign contained both the excitement of finally being in action, but followed by the challenge of offensive warfare against stubborn German defenders, exacerbating the roller coaster that was German morale, or sorry, Canadian morale in Italy was the eventual overshadowing by the invasion of Northwestern Europe. While mail was just as important in every other theater, it's in Italy that this topic creates a highly animated discussion. So I realize uh, that not everyone here today may know about the Italian campaign. So I'm gonna take a minute uh, to give a brief overview of what was going on in 1943. So we're all on the same page. So Germany still dominated vast amounts of Europe as we can see by the red on the map here. However, the Soviets were beginning to turn the tables on the Eastern Front with the victory at with their victory at the Battle of Stalingrad which you can see on the far right there. As well, the Western Allies had finally defeated Germany in North Africa. And, you know, so things were going, you know, starting, the tide was starting to turn. Um, as well, the West, or sorry, Stalin was desperate uh, for the Western Allies to open up a second European front, as this would relieve some pressure on the Eastern Front. However, the Western Allies were not yet ready to launch a full scale invasion of the continent. Thus, they opted for Italy, which was known as the soft underbelly of Europe. They had some control over the Mediterranean after their victory in North Africa, so it was decided that it would start in Sicily, which was invaded in July 1943. They won over the island in just over a month and then began working their way um, up the Italian mainland. The Italian army put up a weak defense and Italy soon surrendered. However, the Germans then took over the defense of Italy and put up an extremely strong uh, resistance all the way through to the end of the war in May 1945. So Canadians were central to Allied progress in Italy. You may have heard of the Battle of Ortona, where the Canadian 1st Infantry Division went up against German paratroopers in what came to be known as the Italian Stalingrad for the high casualty rates that occurred. In Canadian memory, the Italian campaign is often overshadowed by events in Northwestern Europe, such as D-Day and Juno Beach, but there's no doubt that the Italian campaign was fundamental to the eventual Allied success. So now to get back to mail and morale, I'd like to draw your attention to the photo on the screen. And I'd like to say that the photos in this presentation are really central um, to what I'm talking about. So this is October 1943. Through the mountains of South Central Italy, the Royal 22nd Regiment made the grueling march towards Campo Basso with Lieutenant Colonel Paul Bernanchez in command. The regiment had been a part of the Canadian efforts in Italy since the July landings in Sicily, but had been overseas much longer some since December 1939. In a break from their trek, Bernanchez took advantage of the precious time. Dropping his things in a haphazard manner, he quickly slouched into a cross-legged position and buried himself into his mail, the closest he could get to life away from the war. The formalities and rigid rigidness practiced while training in Canada and Britain were no longer, as a battalion's commander sat vulnerable and immersed, his body visibly leaning towards the page. 
This candid moment is was captured by the camera's lens and speaks volumes to the importance of male in wartime. Often studies are done on a specific set of letters that happened to survive the war intact thanks to a sentimental recipient in Canada paired with luck and safekeeping over many decades. Due to the intimacy and individuality of letters, this is not surprising. A single set of letters can easily contain enough information to provide the basis for an entire story. However, mail is not only about what was written on the page, it can be used for much more than that. Correspondence does not just exist in a singular sense, but lends itself to the much larger flow of information crossing the Atlantic. Both writing and receiving mail was a common experience for virtually every single Canadian soldier, a claim that few other topics can make. With that in mind, I'm going to take you through six themes uh, that expand the way we think about a mundane topic like mail. The first, and perhaps the themes with the most to discuss, is the personal aspect of mail. So the influence of mail over a soldier's personal morale is not to be understated. Maintaining a connection with their family and friends from home was vital affiliation with their previous civilian lives, providing a great source of comfort and relative stability in un such uncertain times. And this benefit was not single-sided. Receiving mail from their son or husband or father overseas was essential for those on the home front. Not only did these letters home maintain connections and help to offer reassurance, but they also served as basic confirmation that the soldier was still alive. This two-way exchange lifted Canadian spirits on both sides of the Atlantic, considering the limits of official and personal censorship that turned writers away from war news, letters were used to exchange personal news, discuss family members, vent concerns, and offer comfort, all intimate affairs. Some of you may know Farley Mowat, who is best known for his skills as an author and environmentalist. However, he also spent five years in the Canadian Army during the Second World War. An officer with the Hastings and Prince Edward Regiment, also known as the Hasty Peas, Mowat uh, participated in the entire Italian campaign right from the Sicilian invasion in 1943 until the bulk of Canadian units were transferred to Northwestern Europe in 1945. He was a prolific letter writer, corresponding with his parents often, and especially his father, Angus, who was a veteran of the First World War and an author himself. While Mowat would uh, not have been, sorry, while Mowat would have been representative of the minority in terms of the regularity and the descriptive nature of his letters, the benefit of these sources is without a doubt. The intimate nature of soldiers' letters is on full display through the Mowat family correspondence. Farley was an only child and seemed to be very close with his parents. Joy was expressed by both parties when mail was received, while a lack of such brought longing. Many letters were filled with stories of research of recent encounters and daily happenings, but not all were lighthearted, especially as the war stretched on. Both of his parents consistently encouraged Farley to keep writing, hoping to maintain his morale through that uh, encouragement. Angus's great war experience made him weary of war's ability to pull men into this mental darkness, and he often reminded his son of such, urging him to carry on and express himself through his letters. During a particularly dark time from Farley in uh, January 1945, his mother wrote to, his, uh, to her son saying, quote, you're a wonderful the way you write so cheerfully, but I know. So just write the way it feels, and if it helps, do so. And thank you, darling, a thousand times for writing so often. Even a short note helps. Some mothers and wives hardly hear from their men overseas and it's killing them, end quote. These sorts of examples of intimacy are in no short supply through Second World War letters and, of course, First World War and any other wartime correspondence. Evidently, letter writing was such a personal affair and had very therapeutic benefits for both the recipient and the writer. In addition to letters being sent to soldiers, families and friends sent parcels and small gifts. Assembled and packaged by their family and friends, these parcels were an intimate item to receive. The fact that the men fighting in Italy were far from their adopted home in Britain, and even further from their actual homes in Canada, made Canadian goods all the better. Common items included socks, cigarettes, and sweets, all of which were highly valued by recipients who looked forward to reminders of home. These sundries supplemented their bare bones, army issued rations and supplies, as exemplified by Hugh Alist Alistair Swinton's letter home, where he wrote, quote, received your parcel and Christmas cake today. The cake arrived in per perfect condition in spite of the long journey. 
We boiled some tea in the dugout, and as the boys all had contributions from parcels, we had a regular feast, and, end quote. Farley Mowat seconds this point when he writes, quote, thank heavens and yourselves for the socks. I've been writing on, I've been riding on rims for weeks, end quote. Cigarettes were also prized gifts as they were consumed with vigor and used or used as an informal currency. Uh, cigarettes sent home were seen sent from home were seen as superior quality to this British V brand uh, and that often made up men's army rations. The personal touches of gifts and parcels were vital components to the Canadian war effort. While mail was personal, it was not always positive. The toll of time and space was difficult on relationships, with one woman hopelessly asking, quote, how does one make love through the mail, unquote. The separation and wartime context was too much for some relationships, often leading to domestic issues or the dreaded Dear John letters, revealing infidelity. Having these types of serious conversations through pen and paper was nothing short of problematic. As one woman wrote to her husband overseas, quote, Things are bound to happen sometimes when an ocean divides us and letters are misinterpreted, end quote. Additional strain was caused by nosy community members who wrote to men overseas to report on the actions of their women at home or by returned servicemen who talked of foreign sexual adventures. The suspicion of disloyalty existed on both ends, and it was the responsibility of male to either fix this situation or sever ties. But it is the point of this sorry, but as is the point of this study, there is more to mail than solely its contents. The second theme I want to discuss is the logistics of wartime mail delivery. So the logistics of mail delivery in the Second World War could be a whole book on its own. Um, an in-depth look at the intricacies of the Postal Corps is really lacking from the historiography, other than a work by Roland uh, H. Webb in 2014. However, the fine details of the Postal Service are beyond the scope of this presentation. Instead, I am going to survey the complexities of mail delivery that are relevant to the Italian theatre. So soldiers in Italy had three options for how to send their letters, uh, ordinary mail, air letters, or air graphs, which were all subject to censorship, weather delays, and the threat of enemy interference. While ordinary mail was unlimited in quantity, it was also the slow method, slowest method, sometimes taking up to three months to reach Canada by ship. And you can read below the others uh, pros and cons of the other options as well on the screen. So men regularly made the personal decision on how to send their mail based on the, important of it, the importance of its contents and the cost, as seen in an excerpt from a letter uh, Gerald S. Andrews to his wife in August 1943. He wrote, your air letter of the 18th reached me in 10 days, which is pretty good, and I'm going to take a chance on this and see if it takes any more time than air graph. Understand that they have a special air mail service now via North Atlantic, so until that is stopped on account of winter weather, these air letters may be our best bet, and they're so much easier to read, as well as having a bit more space. Quite often, I reach the bottom of the air graphs all too soon and don't have enough to make a second sheet worthwhile. So not only was the outgoing mail, um, you know, was there outgoing mail to deal with, but the efficiency of incoming mail was just as vital. So historian William Pratt explains, quote, mail, show, mail showed soldiers that those back home supported their efforts and had not forgotten them. Men built up great anticipation for mail delivery, and there was real disappointment if no news was had from home or Britain. So in the early stages of the Italian campaign, mail was sent from Canada first to the UK where it was sorted and then sent to Italy. But by February 1944, so the Canadians had been in Italy for about eight months at this point, uh, complaints were quite vocal over postal delays. On this topic, Farley Mowat wrote to his parents. He said, just finished censoring a batch of outgoing letters. You'd be surprised at the amount of complaining men do about their mail situation. So news on this issue finally found the right ears uh, in Canada and led to the arrangement for mail to be shipped directly from Canada to Italy. The difference made by this new system was noticed with one soldier writing, quote, the mail service is better than it was in England, far, fed, far better in fact, unquote. And the invasion of Europe was yet to begin. Sub, which would subsequently over, overshadow the Italian campaign. But while the Canadians were only in Italy, that's where their priority lay. And so in fact, Canada became the sole nation to dedicate an entire air squadron to mail service uh, at that point. 
But of course, things would change once the Italian uh, campaign was not the only campaign that Canadians were fighting. So organizing this flow of goods and communications was a significant task, hence the arrival of the Canadian Postal Corps in Sicily mere weeks after the landing. They would soon transfer their operations to the Italian mainland for the duration of Canadian involvement there. And however, the improvements made by the airmail system were not consistent. Only one month after they started shipping directly from Canada, Italy, the censorship report stated that disappointment in the service is widespread and criticism is not confined to any particular area or unit. One of the biggest issues became known as bunching, where the delivery of mail lost consistency and instead came irregularly and in large batches. Farley Mowat experienced bunching in his mail in early April, and he told his parents, quote, nobody here has had air graphs or air mail from home in more than a month. Yet yesterday, I got three ordinary letters from you dated March 27, 29, and 30. What the hell goes on, do you suppose? Rocket delivery at the last week of the month? By April 1944, the mail situation had deteriorated so that the censorship reports deemed the men's anger to be of alarming proportions. These wrinkles were smoothed out by June, but this is just as the Normandy invasions began, and of course that took priority over Italy. The disparity was not a secret, as in January 1945, before being transferred to Northwestern Europe, Farley complained to his parents, quote, we have only had one letter mail in the last six weeks, and it was a thin one, but I suppose Italy is small potatoes these days, and we are forgotten potato weevils. The logistics of mail delivery to and from the Italian theater makes the growing pains um, clear that the Postal Corps experienced. But very rarely, interestingly enough, was anger taken out at the Postal Corps itself, um, as exemplified by a quote picked out for the censorship report in February 1944. So this soldier wrote, quote, the mail situation isn't very good at present, but the, under the circumstances, I think that the postal people are doing a darn good job, unquote. Mail was vital, so much so that one officer believed his men at times would be willing to trade a meal for a single letter and so was its coordination. So onto the third theme, which is the ritualization of mail in wartime. So there became a ritualization to writing and receiving mail, especially as the duration of time apart increased. So the, the, despite the busyness of war work and family life or regimented schedule of soldiering, um, it was a regular part of daily life to either write a letter or pack a parcel or have an officer distribute mail or check the mailbox. Receiving mail was a highlight in the days of many Canadians, as the narrator in the National Film Board's 1940 film Letter from Aldershot um, says, as soldiers gleefully receive parcels and mail, he says, don't forget that every one of us lives for mail day. So such a concept is illustrated by this photograph you see on the screen here of Canadian soldiers receiving packages at a military post office in England. So you can see the jubilates on the faces of those receiving mail, and this seems to be quite a, a collective celebration. So mail was not only about what it contained, but also the physical act of receiving it. The rush of relief brought by the mailbox being full or one's name being called by their officer was in stark contrast to the lonely feeling of no mail. Of this absence, Farley Mowat's mother wrote, quote, last week was not so good. No letters and Angus and Elmer, the dog, returned from the post office with long faces every evening. But we know that you are so good about writing that this isn't any of your doing, unquote. So for men overseas, the logistical issue of mail being delivered in bunches speaks to the value given to the handing out of mail. It was meaningful to have their mail their names called out regularly by their officer. Mowat describes his appreciation for his parents' uh, consistent correspondence when he writes, quote, as you have no doubt long ago, as you no doubt long ago appreciated it, the mail is uh, the breath of us here. God, how we curse when it's delayed or how we sneak away into private corners with gloating expressions when they do arrive. It's a grim thing indeed to be the lone mammal in the mess who doesn't even have an honorable mention on mail days. Thanks to my ever thoughtful parents, this doesn't happen to me, unquote. So Farley Mowat's quote is telling as the publicity of handing out mail in an army unit uh, made this ritual a public one. 
And in letter to his father, uh, James F. Watson discusses his experience receiving a thoughtfully assembled package in front of his comrades. He describes how anyone who witnessed its contents gave it high praise and how to receive a package such as this was to score. So the act of writing letters became somewhat ritualized as well. When letters were your only contact with a loved one for multiple years, they became a sacred space in which honesty and thoughtfulness and vulnerability prevailed. And these are all traditionally unmasculine traits, which now became essential in the maintenance of relationships of all types. This required time and focus, a luxury that was not always available in the active warfare of Italy, but regular correspondence was a priority for most. Maintaining contact with loved ones during the war years took priority, creating a sort of ritualization surrounding acts of writing a letter, packing a parcel, having an officer distribute mail, or checking the mailbox. So the fourth theme is the quantification of mail. So the flow of mail across the Atlantic was not without scrutiny. Official censors read thousands of letters destined for Canada every week, which were a sample of the larger whole. They then compiled bi-monthly reports based on common topics mentioned in the letters. These censorship reports, which were initiated prior to the Italian campaign, were valuable indicators of morale and allowed the contents of private mail to now enter the army bureaucracy. As soldiers knew that writing about battle specifics would not pass the censor's inspection, they tended to stick to non-combat subjects such as news from home, politics, food, comfort, alcohol and tobacco, recreation, or the weather. These reports condensed to mail into a qualitative measure, uh, sorry, in, yeah, into a quali from a qualitative measure of the male's, men's experience in Italy into this quantitative um, condensed report, proving to be a goldmine of information, but it is not without its caveats. Oops. So a tremendous strength of the censorship reports is the sheer volume of letters they were able to comb through and the unprecedented opportunity this provided to hear the contents and concerns of ordinary soldiers. So a report from fall of 1941, which I, I realize is before Italy, but uh, reports that at minimum 13,000 letters destined for Canada were examined every two weeks. So this really took a whole army of censors. The army saw letter writing as an expression of morale, and the censorship reports provided a rapid method of testing the temperature of that sample. So the fact that the censorship reports provided quotes um, and summaries of the sentiments that were expressed by a majority of letters um, examined is another strength. It's in a civilian army representing a democratic nation that the thoughts and feelings of the ordinary soldier mattered. So despite you know, their grievances, um, widespread displeasure would not be left unattended. So fortunately, these reports were published quickly enough uh, to be seen by you know, army commanders and, and government and things like that. So they were able to deal with these issues, but this didn't actually resolve the mail crisis of early 1944 that I discussed earlier. However, there were limitations to using letters to gauge soldiers' morale, as in any type of human study. So firstly, the mailbags chosen for examination were only a small sample of the whole. So in 1941, which again I realize is before Italy, but as described by the Canadian official historian C.P. Stacey, the British authorities would collect three bags of mail each day from the HQ of the Canadian Postal Corps in Acton. The bags had previously been sorted by seven Canadian regional destinations, meaning that these three bags were a mix of different units and ranks. So efforts were made to alternate which region's mail was examined. And of course, this setup only applied to when the whole Canadian force was stationed in the UK, meaning that the logistics of choosing mail for the censorship reports most likely changed during the Italian campaign. A second weakness of the censorship reports is that they're limited to what the censors believe to be most important. So the focus um, was on topics that mattered in the immediate situation. While this benefits historians by helping identify what defined morale at the time, we also have to deal with human error, omission, and overemphasis. It's not necessarily unreasonable to assume that in reading thousands of letters daily, there could be a tendency to pick the most dramatic quotes. So what the censors chose to include influences the overall picture of the Canadian situation in Italy, but these reports were not catch-alls and should not be treated as such. So as C.P. Stacey wrote in 1941, quote, the truth of any statement made in a soldier's letter cannot be accepted without investigation, unquote. 
This is the third caveat to the censorship reports. So soldiers may not always be truthful in their letters, nor may they be accurate. Perhaps they are putting on a brave face for their worried parents or lover, while on the opposite end of the spectrum, they could be using this as an opportunity to vent or complain. Issues such as conscription and home leave were political and made soldiers really riled up, bringing often a bitter tone to their letters. While their mood over such issues could be affected by all sorts of trivial situations, um, like when they last ate or when they felt safe, Stacy found an ideal example of this as one soldier wrote to his wife, quote, well, honey, I've had supper. Never mind the last paragraph. I was just letting off steam, unquote. Letters penned from soldiers who spent time recovering in comfortable hospitals far away from the front often had a rosier tone, as the warm, dry beds were in severe contrast to the wet slit trenches of the Italian mountains. Citizen soldiers were first and foremost human, and a whole range of factors could influence their mood on a daily basis. So to zoom in, we can look at two morale reports from the Italians or sorry, from the Canadians in Italy in October 1944, which generally show decreasing morale. The men were not looking forward to spending another cold, wet winter in Italy, uh, and it showed. And the likelihood of spending another Christmas in Italy was also disheartening, but some soldiers made clear efforts to keep their families from over worrying. One sapper wrote, quote, don't get the idea that my morale is low. I'm just merely letting you know what the score is down here before winter sets in. We just look at conditions as they come, make fun of the situation, have a laugh, and tell ourselves that it could be worse, unquote. In the same report, uh, the censors chose a quote from a private who said, old Jerry here is a good fighter, but I think we are a little better, for he can't seem to break a Canadian heart no matter how hard he tries, unquote. But the optimism of these two quotes is not visible in the majority of the censorship report. Each soldier was an individual with a varying relationship to who he is writing to, as well as a varying understanding of the current situation. So the fifth and second last theme uh, is the way that mail and po the postal service were used as propaganda by the Canadian government and army. So the importance of mail was not lost on the government nor the army. The connection between correspondence and good morale was a priority for both sides of the Atlantic. Keeping families in touch meant reliable postal services, and they hoped to showcase their efforts in order to boost morale and support. So for the army, this came through the Maple Leaf, which was an overseas Canadian newspaper for soldiers. The government's case was aided through uh, national newspapers like the Globe and Mail and in national film board films. So visual proof of their efforts never hurt either, like we can see on the, in the photo here. Um, and both civilians and soldiers had to be convinced that the utmost was being done to keep the mail flowing, turning mail into a propaganda tool of sorts. So the topic of mail is relatively common in the Maple Leafs Italian edition. Uh, in late 1943 and into 1944, the publication was used to respond to complaints over mail delays, which we discussed. But several, length art, several full length articles were dedicated to explaining the reasons why the slow service was occurring, a clear attempt to smooth over any flared tempers. An educational approach was often taken and the workings of the mail system were explained to soldiers. The increased communication of wartime made organizing the mail for a single regiment, which is about a thousand soldiers, the equivalent to doing so for a town about, of about 50 to 60,000 civilians. So um, obviously a lot more work. At the start of 1945, it was published that 120 million Canadian letters were sent in 1944 by air alone. This uh, is also inform there's also informative articles on how uh, the mail was forwarded when soldiers were transferring between units, trying to reassure people that their mail would be received. And receiving mail was an intimate event for soldiers who had been, sorry, uh, away for a long time. And, you know, the Maple Leaf was employed to convince people that postal services were prioritized just as highly by, as, um, by Canadian command. As the newspaper wrote, the Maple Leaf, Quote, the mail must get through, even if it's charred, water-soaked, and almost illegible when it arrives, unquote. The use of planes to deliver mail was a risk. Crashes and accidents were not uncommon, leading to the loss of thousands of letters. In an attempt to relieve some of the stress that this missing mail caused, both the army and the government published brief informative statements if crashes did occur. Rather than leaving people wondering why their mail was missing, they decided that it was better to be transparent. Wartime propaganda had to walk this fine line between optimism and truth, especially in the case of mail. 
On the home front, mail was under the command of the Postmaster General. Uh, it was important to publicize the government's cooperative efforts to expedite postal services, as seen by a number of articles published in the Globe and Mail throughout the war years. For the Christmas season of 1943, the newspaper included photos of the efficient postal corps in Ottawa rushing to get parcels delivered on time. And there's even a photo that I wasn't able to include today of them employing high school students during this uh, Christmas rush to get all the um, letters sorted and out the door. So one article in the Globe and Mail um, compared mail statistics from October 1942, so before Canada's in sustained action, and October 1943, you know, a few months into the Italian campaign, of which the total pounds of parcels sent increased by about 60%. So while an independent newspaper, the Globe and Mail's inclusion of these war-related topics speaks to both government and civilian priorities. Content produced by the National Film Board, which was a government agency, only further emphasized Mail's central role in the war effort. So there was three films, um, Letter from Aldershot in 1940, Letter from Camp Borden in 1941, and Letter from Overseas in 1943, which were produced as, mail, as morale boosting propaganda and used the format of a letter either being written by the serviceman or by his family receiving it. So none of them are in reference to the Italian campaign, but I think it'd be a mistake not to mention these sources because they really are fantastic and you can Google them and, um, and watch them yourself. So in all three, the narrator, the narrator is reading out or expanding on a letter that describes the soldier's life where he is stationed. So within the first minute of letter from Aldershot, um, it cuts to a soldier dutifully writing a letter home with the words, dear mother, uh, clearly visible on the top of the page, which you can see on the right there. It's followed by a pan shot of many men immersed in their letter writing. And letter from overseas begins with mail being unloaded from a plane and delivered to a family home where the soldier's mother then reads the letter over the phone to a friend, which you can see on the left. This heartwarming image, um, oh, where did it go here? And a heartwarming image of a young girl receiving mail um, from her brother is how Letter from Camp Borden commences. And these crafted narratives really reinforce the significance of mail and the importance of staying connected during the war. And these are all values that the government and the army needed to prove their alliance to. But in a similar fashion to soldiers' inconsistent feelings on the efforts being put into the postal services, civilians were not, only co not always convinced by their government's efforts. A man from Kitchener, Ontario, submitted an opinion piece to the Globe and Mail applauding a senator from Manitoba for criticizing the government's handlings of postal services to and from Italy. His article concluded, quote, Loyal Canadians are fed up on promises and petty speeches regarding this so-called new air mail service, unquote. The intimacy of mail not only served, you know, it served to flare up these tempers when issues arose, requiring both the government and the army to publicize their efforts in an attempt to garner support. And the final theme for today is the organization or encouragement of letter writing. So mail was such this was so vital to the upkeep of morale that it became organized and encouraged. So authorities and organizations of all different levels promoted this activity to servicemen throughout the war. One way to quietly encourage soldiers to write was to provide supplies. Rest clubs run by auxiliary services, such as the Salvation Army or the YMCA, offered free stationery to soldiers when they visited. But some men needed further encouragement. So an article by Major R.E. Beamish from the Maple Leafs publication of 24 uh, February 1944 directly calls upon soldiers who do not write often to do so. So the article is titled, If You Don't Write Often, Read This. The article argues that mail boosts morale on both sides of the Atlantic. Pointed at soldiers, the author tells of the difference mail makes for those on the home front, especially a lack of. So for evidence, this author, um, he describes a mother who waits for the postman every day with a hopeful smile, but has been disappointed for over six months. Or the wife who dreads the part of her week where she goes to her, um, her weekly sewing group meetings where everyone reads out portions of their letters they've received from overseas, but she has nothing to contribute. So the author finishes with a reminder to his male readers, quote, Doubt and uncertainty can penetrate and chill the feminine heart just as surely as the melting snow in your slit trench soaks through to get at you. The suspense of long protracted waiting for word from you is as hard as it to take as any of your own moments of suspense and fear. Letters in the mailbox are the very next best thing to having you there yourself, unquote. 
The encouragement of regular communication with a dash of guilt only reinforces the importance of correspondence, no matter the situation uh, the recipient was in. The importance of communication in an official sense is spelled out in um, a 1942 publication from the Canadian Army headquarters, which is titled Morale. Written for the junior army officer, this brief booklet covers a, a number of topics that Canadian command considered to be important for morale of their troops. And it mandates that junior officers become team leaders, amateur psychologists, counselors, dealing with everything from hunger and sex to fear, uh, to fear and social relationships. So mail is the second last topic to be discussed in this booklet, and it directs officers to remain aware of each man's mail situation. If an individual is receiving little or no mail, it's the officer's responsibility to remedy this. He is to remind the soldier to write home to his family and friends, and even offer to write the soldier's family himself. Junior officers are also told to write their men's parents or wives every three months to maintain this line of communication and provide assurance and comfort. Lastly, the booklet uh, instructs officers to assure their men that both ranks and officers are subject to the same term around time in responses uh, by mail, and all are equal in this sense. However, if a rapid response is needed for an urgent issue such as illness or domestic um, complication, the officer should arrange for postal, faster postal services. So mail was not only important to the individual soldier, but it was actually also really seen as important to the strength of the unit of a, as a whole, making it worthwhile to put efforts into this kind of encouragement. So with that, I'm gonna leave you with some concluding thoughts. There's no question that mail was a powerful influencer of morale for Canadians in all situations in the Second World War. Correspondence kept people in contact despite years of separation, while parcels were intimate gifts that doubled as useful supplies. However, as this research has shown through the study of the Italian campaign, the role of mail can be studied from a number of different angles, not just simply what is written on the page. This thematic approach to the study of mail functions as a survey for further exploration into the Canadian experience of the war and its mundane topics such as mail that can serve to broaden our knowledge. And if you are to take anything away from today, perhaps it's an appreciation of what communication was like 80 years ago. Uh, in the days of instant messaging today, we often forget to consider what it's like to receive or send a letter. But this is a highlight for those that lived during the Second World War. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Megan. That, that's fantastic. Um, just as we... Uh... As we pause for questions here, a quick reminder for those of you on uh, on the chat watching us live on YouTube, um, there is a delay between what we're seeing here in the quote unquote studio on Zoom and what you're seeing on YouTube. So um, we, Megan kind of wrapped up her talk probably about 30 or 40 seconds before you see the end of it. Um, so if there are any questions that I end up missing, um, that tends to happen because they've been posted after we've kind of wrapped up. And so I apologize for that. Um, but please feel free to get your questions in. Uh, Megan, if it's all right, um, Tom will chastise me later. But I always like to uh, uh, prime the pump, as it were, with a few questions of my own um, yeah, of while, we, while we wait for those to, to roll in. Um, so I had a couple. The, the one that I was, I was kind of struck by, and I think you sort of alluded to it right at the end, um, I'm wondering about the theme of mail as sort of a small unit cohesion, and 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 that works kind of on uh, on both ends. We tend to look at that from from an army focus, but you mentioned sort of the sewing groups and and bringing letters forward um, and that sort of thing. But I'm wondering if you if you've looked at all at, at sort of the act of sharing mail and how that brings people together, say in a platoon or a section or in a sewing group. Yeah, yeah, we really see this happen on both sides. And I, I think you can pull kind of various examples from what I mentioned, you know, like mail being read out at a, at a sewing group or, um, you know, at a family dinner or things like that, but also mail being read out, um, you know, within on the other side of the Atlantic within an army unit. Um, and, you know, some men were receiving more mail than others. And of course, that was the same on the other side. So, um, you know, often people were also hearing mail from other soldiers and getting to um, kind of join in that experience and that that correspondence. Um, so it does become 
you know, not only is it important, like I said, for the individual, but also for this group, group cohesion and not even just army group cohesion, you know, um, on the other side of things on the Canadian home front, um, it, you know, it didn't just work on the in individual level. It, uh, it was a collective, uh, a collective activity as well. And so um, we have the notion that um, certainly packages were never, were never private. Right. It was always, you know, if you got a Christmas cake, it was it was expected that you share. Do you, mm -hmm. do you really see that as it was that a, a given expectation? Yes. Yes. And especially, like I said, because some soldiers were receiving, you know, plenty of gifts and some were receiving none. Um, so there is this expectation to share. Um, but, you know, it's it's this is, you know. I want to, you know, make sure that everyone, you know, understands that I'm not trying to paint one wide swath of um, of a narrative today. There's many different narratives within the war. I mean, really, the war is made of, of of hundreds of thousands of individual experiences from which we can really just find common patterns and experiences. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there were soldiers, obviously, that were selfish and probably didn't want to share and didn't share. But I, I would say from the sources that I've read that it was generally expected um, that, you know, if someone received something, um, everyone would contribute what they did. And, you know, often for little holidays, Thanksgiving or Christmas, um, people would try to bring what they had. Right. Well, and actually, that's a really nice segue to um, <laughs> sort of the question I had very early on when you were talking about some of the, the sources um, including your own uh, supervisor, talking about sort of the morale across an army to me mm -hmm. seems far too high level. And, and I know um, a lot of the um, a, a lot of historians are are tending now to to dig much closer into the individual soldiers. Um, but do you find that looking at morale, say from a um, an Italian campaign or even a division or a regiment. Do you think that's valuable in considering the morale of the individual or was mm -hmm. it really so varied that, you know, looking at the, like, I'm just wondering if, if the morale for regiment and it's saying, oh, you know, the, the Van Dues have a very high morale. Is, is that, is that valuable in understanding what the individuals or was there always so much variation that it, it it's hard to tell? Yeah, I, so it, it's a good point. I think there's, uh, you know, there, it goes extreme both ways, right? You know, um, so I mean, Jonathan Fennell, uh, my current supervisor, um, you know, he has written this absolute tomb of a book, um, which I just happen to have with me. But, you know, so what he's trying to do, which is, you know, it goes both ways. Um, so he essentially is trying to, to quantify this, you know, like how do we, what indicators can we look in, you know, these huge, you know, arm, whole army unit, army groups um, across the world, what indicators can we look at to assess their morale on a very macro level, um, you know, rates of desertion, rates of sickness, um, things like that. And, and he's trying to like quantify it and put this into graphs and charts. So I would say that's one extreme and he's trying to do this on a very macro level. Um, but then, you know, there's the other extreme is trying to just like, um, you know, kind of graph out the, the morale of an individual. And I, I think there's there's pros and cons to both, but I think that it's valuable to look at different levels and those are two extremes. But like you were saying, um, Chris, there is the in-betweens. Let's look at the regiments. Let's look at, at campaigns and things. Um, and, you know, I think you're gonna, you're gonna be able to pull interesting information from all different levels. Um, and I, I would prefer personally, I think they're most, it's most valuable if you're gonna kind of come into the middle in a regiment or a campaign level, um, you know, these kind of people that are having common experiences or in common circumstances, um, because we know each individual could be slightly different um, versus doing things on a very macro level. Obviously you could miss over um, a lot of experience. So I think that it's important to, to you know, use different lenses um, when looking at morale because morale is really tricky. And this is the thing is historians haven't figured out how to, you know, th there's not this social science method. And that's, I think what, you know, maybe what Jonathan's trying to do is, is create this kind of social science method to be able to um, quantify morale. And it, I think it's, I mean, what I, I, I just finished writing my master's thesis um, and I was looking at an army training camp in my hometown. So in Vernon, British Columbia, 
um, and looking at the experience of morale there. And what I ended up arguing, um, and this is in a training experience, which what we haven't been talking about today, which is training, um, I actually argue that there's too many moving factors to be able to quantify morale. Because if you think about um, soldiers' experience with civilians, like how long they've been in the army, um, you know, what kind of experience they've had, things are shifting and changing all the time, that um, morale is just this kind of it's, it's going to occupy historians for military historians for a long time, because I don't think we're ever really going to nail it down. I think, I think it's going to kind of constant, constantly slip out of our grasp, but it provides really, you know, really interesting material for study. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just thinking as you were saying that, and as uh, at the end of your talk, while you're sort of comparing it to uh, instant messaging today, right, the idea of morale and the effects on morale, um, looking at the Second World War compared to the First World War or compared to now and or the Napoleonic Wars. And there's just different factors again, right? So the idea that it just gets more sl slippery as you, as you go. But um, yeah. I'd like, I've got a couple questions here um, that have posted, been posted in the chat. Uh, I believe this is Melissa Wing, who was one of our other three minute thesis uh, finalists. So uh, welcome, Melissa. Um, so she said, uh, first off, wonderful talk, Megan. Um, she apologized if you mentioned this earlier, but I don't think you did. And she just wants to know if you have a favorite set of letters that you've come across mm -hmm. so far. Ah, okay. Hi, Melissa. Uh, nice to nice to hear from you. Um, yeah, that's a fantastic question. What a fun question to ask. I, I have to say, I mean, as I, I did use Farley Mode a lot in this in this talk, and I have to say that reading. Um, reading my father's son, that collection of letters between he and his father was, was, I mean, what pulled me into this topic? And I just find that because it's such a complete section of, of co co a complete collection of letters, um, it has a real narrative to it. And both, you know, Farley and his father are, are prolific authors and writers. So it's, it's, I mean, it's really nice writing to read. Um, but I do have to say that, and, you know, because I did, I did want to make sure I point out this source at some point. Um, there's a source run by uh, Victoria Island University. It's called uh, CLIP. So it's the Canadian Letters and Images Project. And what they've done, I'm not sure if it's active right now, but they've done this work over the years, is they've um, had Canadians from, you know, across the country send their letters and they've digitized them and typed them up. And they have this amazing database. And the really awesome thing is it's open to anyone. Um, so if you go to, if you Google Canadian Letters and Images Project, um, there's letters from, you know, both World Wars and the Korean War. Um, you can search things by people's name, by keywords, all these different kinds of, of, of filters. And I mean, there's fantastic letters on there. So um, if you're looking, you know, wanting to read letters, or maybe you have letters from from um, a relative who served um, might be worth looking into. But thanks, Melissa, for that question. That sounds like a fantastic project. Thank you. Um, so one question here, I'm just going to read it verbatim to make sure I don't uh, don't misquote it here. Um, uh, so this person is asking if you can talk about a bit more about the impact of the censorship reports. Mm -hmm. And then they say specifically, did they influence policy regarding morale? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So these censorship reports, which I, I know I, you know, kind of talked about, they were this really valuable source that hasn't been used a lot by historians. Um, Jonathan got into using them. Um, my master's supervisor, uh, Jeffrey Hayes, has gotten into using them. And I'm fairly certain he has a book coming out on Canadian morale, but I won't say more than that. Um, but, you know, um, these censorship reports are this are this gold mine worth of information. So, you know, they were taking, literally taking soldiers' letters. And, you know, as I was talking about, certain amounts of letters were being read by these official censors. Um, and then these censors were compiling these reports based on topics that they found um, common throughout these letters. So, I mean, you know, just as a as some as some really kind of ones that came out a lot were things like um, the conscription crisis in 1944. Obviously, that um, was a really heated topic uh, for soldiers who were overseas. Things like the war in Japan, uh, morale. But then, I mean, things like food and and you know, mail and things like this, like communication. Um, and so it, it does affect policy because, like I said, there was in that, uh, when was it, in winter 1943, when they're really having issues with um, bunching of mail and, and just mail not being delivered in Italy. Um, and then they start doing that direct um, delivery right from Canada to Italy instead of going through the UK. 
uh, that that was a, a product of the censorship reports. So the censorship reports are a wonderful source. Um, like I talked about in my discussion, they have their, you know, obviously their pros and cons, um, but they're a source that I see historians beginning to use. And I think that they have much more, um, you know, mileage to go for future studies. I, I'm going to wade in with a, a question or two of my own here. So I, I will <laughs> go no ahead. longer chastise Chris because I compile <laughs> my own questions, but um, I'm wondering uh, from, whether it's from a logistics perspective or even uh, using the censorship reports, how did the, the Canadian Army uh, and their management of mail differ from the other armies in the European theatre? Hmm. Expanding my knowledge here. <laughs> you're, 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 uh, you're testing my knowledge here. Um, I'm, I'm fairly certain that uh, the Canadians um, and the British in terms of censorship acted quite similarly. I know for a time the Canadians even kind of used the British system. Um, like I mentioned, you know, um, when C.P. Stacey was writing about the fact that in 1941, um, it was the British HQ that was picking up Canadian mailbags to take them to this, uh, this kind of censorship um, base. Um, uh, uh, yeah, center. Um, so I think that it was run fairly similarly um, as the British, but I mean, you know, and I, I would like to look into this. This is something to do, and I, I appreciate um, adding to my to-do list, uh, <laughs> but, you know, the British are in quite a different situation, um, right, than, than the Canadians or the Australians and the, and the New Zealanders, and, and I think someone, I mean, maybe they've looked into it, and I haven't, I haven't looked into too much of the Aussie and Kiwi stuff, but, you know, how is Canadian mail um, being done compared to how is Australian and, and New Zealander mail being done, because they're very similar situations, right, in terms of geography, um, and I mean, of course, the Australians and the New Zealanders were, you know, most, you know, more of them were fighting down in the South Pacific, so they were also closer to home, I guess, uh, maybe closer to a British situation, but that's something to be looked at um, for certain. But um, I know that, so, sorry, my mind is very Commonwealth oriented these days because that is the, the framework of my current PhD dissertation is army training across the Commonwealth. But I know that US mail system, um, the US mail system was excellent generally. I mean, that's painting a wide brush a stroke, but I know, I think I read a source that said that one Canadian officer was able to sneak his mail one time into the American system and it arrived in like five days or something like that into uh, to Canada. So um, there was definitely, you know, obviously there'd be a bit of jealousy if, if you know, different countries knew that that systems were different. And obviously for the Canadians, if, if the American system is, is superior, that's going to leave them a little bit sour. All right. Uh, another question popped into the chat here. So we're, we're talking about censorship. Uh, Peggy's asking, were the letters actually censored? She's referencing uh, the U.S. where she talked about her dad's letters to her mother had a lot of black marker through words. Yeah, yeah, well, for sure, right? Like any any reference to, you know, units, um, locations, numbers, anything that could, I mean, technically be used as a benefit to the enemy was censored. Um, Peggy, as you, you know, as you see on your on your relatives' letters. Um, and, you know, I've even, you know, seen some that have on the envelope that they return to sender if it was if it was just too, um, you know, there was too much information in there that was that was not going to pass the sensor, they could also return it to the soldier. Um, so that, you know, it he could rewrite it or do as he chose. And things were, you know, censored at different levels too, right? This is the thing is that um, soldiers had, you know, often it was their kind of just their commanding officer looking through their letters. So I did mention like Farley was talking about uh, censoring his men's letters because he was an officer. But there was also there was these, I forget what they're called, but this certain kind of letter that soldiers got um, once a week or once a month or something, um, where it was a certain color of paper or envelope that it actually, it skipped their commanding officer and went up to a higher censorship level. And that's partially because you know, men are connected to their officers, their officers know them and they don't, there might be some things, you know, some intimate details um, or things like that, that they don't want someone who knows them reading. Uh, so there were censors at various different levels. And obviously these censorship reports were compiled by um, almost like professional, professional censors. So yes, things were, things were very much censored at, at all different levels. All right. Um you use wonderful photographs to accentuate your your presentation. Uh, is there a common source for them, or a variety of sources? 
Yes, uh, no, common source. Um, if you go on Library and Archives Canada's website, um, fantastic sources. And that's also what took me down this, this trail was just the fantastic photos available. Um, I mean, of that one I, you know, early on of, of the commander of a regiment, like sitting cross-legged reading a letter, that's just so moving. Um, and yeah, so if you go onto Library and Archives Canada's um, website, they've recently redone their website. So it's, you know, supposedly a little bit more user-friendly. Um, if you search in World War II mail um, or writing a letter, World War II, things like that, um, these letters or these photos will pop up with all their information available. Um, and it's a fantastic source. And of course, you know, that's the Canadian source. Um, if for, for British stuff or more widely Commonwealth, uh, you can look at the Imperial War Museum's website um, and find photos there too as well. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, you you reference again that, that one picture that 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 really stood out. The mm -hmm. Van Dus commanding officer with, with that intimate moment. Uh, I guess escapism, eh? Like emerging immersing himself in his personal mail. So yeah, very much. All right. Um Chris, I don't know if you, you want to jump back in as we wrap up. Yeah, I just want to, uh, I think we've covered all the questions. So, uh, but I just want to, um, uh, I'm sure Tom will say the same thing, but this was fantastic. Thank you so much, mate. I mean, it's uh, one of our goals in the three minute thesis competition was to kind of connect ourselves and Heritage Days to some um, sort of up and coming historians um, and, and some new research. And this has been a fantastic first step. So thank you so much for, for joining us. And uh, that was fantastic. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chris says it says it all. So um, hey, once again, as we wrap this up, for those watching, hey, if you if you have a moment, click on the subscribe button. Well, we really appreciate that level of support. And uh, we'll be back in November with the next talk. So thank you so much, Megan. That, that was absolutely outstanding. Really appreciate that. And with that, I'm going 